common water hemp that I know, that we know of uh, since 2013, basically that first map I showed you a few slides back. And this is what we're looking at today. Um, we've had a jump of, I know it says 18 there, but it's, I counted this morning, and I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote it. It's 17 counties since 2013 have been confirmed to light state resistance. Uh, you can see these two solid red counties here too. Those are multiple resistant county populations, or multiple resistant populations. And uh, I think that's Iowa County and Jackson County, I believe. Um, so we just found out about those tail end of 2016. You can see all those asterisks. Those are the populations that were tested by the University of Illinois Plant Clinic. Uh, graciously, they sent us those results so we could add them to our list, uh, so we could be more knowledgeable what was going on in our state. And you'll also notice that there's this pretty big dead area in the middle right here. Um, and I suspect that that's probably not accurate representation of that area. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd be willing to bet that there's not only water hemp uh, in that area, there's probably some kind of resistance. Uh, I would, I've seen it with my own eyes just driving around the state enough to know that that's probably not an accurate representation. We just haven't heard about it yet. Uh, so as always, I urge Growers, if you notice something, let your county extension agents know. Uh, let somebody know at the university so we can get a better representation of what's going on in the state. So here's the Palmer Ranch map. Uh, it's kind of alluded to at the very beginning. It's not as serious, uh, but I mean, it's starting to increase in expected weeds. They don't just disappear. They tend to spread out and go farther away. Uh, the most recent one, and I know it's hard to see with the way I formatted this map, but we do have a known population up here in Wishara County, uh, so not too far away from where we're at now, down near Coloma. Uh, confirmed life state resistance in the very first population we found, uh, that was in Dane County in 2013. Since then, we've added uh, four known populations, the Iowa County one that I was showing you with all the resistance uh, a few slides ago. We know about a population in Grant County that is susceptible to everything we've thrown at it so far. We've tested glyphosate, and I believe imazepapir, and it's come back susceptible to those so far. Um, but that's one to keep an eye on. We know of uh, dual resistance, multiple resistance in Sock County. Uh, that is to, oh no, that's Iowa County, excuse me. So acrivid DNA is inhibitor, multiple resistance. And then we know of another uh, glyphosate resistant population in Sock. That was, uh, Reported to us by the University of Illinois Plant Clinic as well. So we know the distribution of the common water hemp has increased rapidly in Wisconsin. Uh, you look at that map in four short years, uh, it's just blown up. And I mean, you can attribute that to a number of factors, uh, be it uh, lack of communication, um, just seed spread. There's a lot of different ways the seed can travel. Uh, Birds is one way, the geese that fly around, they'll land around uh, and give you a nice little present some year. We've seen cases where that's been confirmed to happen. Missouri did a study at a waterfowl where they took the, the guts from <coughs> ducks that have been hunted, uh, opened those up to see what they could find in those guts, and they found not just water hemp from Palmer County, they found all sorts of crazy stuff in there. Um, so it's been confirmed to be moved by waterfowl. So when we see big rivers and big creeks, or high traffic areas for, for those birds. That's one thing we think about sometimes when we look at the spread of water hemp. Uh, just spreading machinery around, that's another good way to spread this. So multiple ways for these, these small weeds to spread. Uh, multiple resistant palm ramaran, palm water hemp. A lot of implications for that. We need to make sure that it doesn't become the normal and that should be maintained to be a, an outlier because we don't want to have to deal with uh, multiple resistant PPO like say palm rain ranch water hemp that's going to seriously knock down our post emergence options for control in soybean especially. Uh, we need to use a diverse resistant management strategy um, which I'm going to touch on here in a bit. So this is a uh, bulletin put out by Take Action Against Herbicide Resistance. Um, you can find this online. I'm going to post a link to it up here at the end of the slide. But this is just kind of a list of their 12 best management practices that they recommend to control herbicide resistance, especially herbicide resistant pig weeds. So it's gonna start with knowing your weeds, knowing how to scout, what to look for. So when it comes to the, the water hemp Palmer Amaran, I know Wayne was talking, he asked, had people asking if this was water hemp or Palmer, just because it's hard to know the difference. And I wish I had brought some plants that don't have any growing in the greenhouse right now to show you up close. 
but I do have pretty good pictures that I've taken in the past. So correct identification, you know, you want to know if you're looking at a water hemp or a palmer, but you also want to know, well, if that's a red root, and it's a little easier to control, I don't need to be so worried. So I'm going to break it down where you want to, what you want to look at first, what you need to notice, and it depends on the time of year. So if you're out there, it's in the vegetative growth stage pretty early on, uh, no flowers on it or anything. Something you're going to want to look at is the stem first thing off. Uh, I know it's probably a little hard to see, but the picture on the left is of a red root pigweed. And it's got very short, soft white hairs. You can kind of see it's got that white sheen to it in the picture. It looks almost like a flash. That's from that white hair, really fine, small white hairs. And you especially want to look up near the top. Excuse me here if I can point. You want to look up here near the top where there's the newest growth. That's where you're most likely to see a lot of those white hairs. So you see that, you know you're pretty safe from, uh, from one of these, one of the palmer or water hemp. So again, I said that was red root pigweed. You also see hairs on the smooth pigweed and the pal amaranth. Again, make sure you look up here because with that smooth pigweed, it can be hard to find those hairs sometimes. Now if it's smooth, and I'm talking baby smooth, no hairs on it at all. Um, I mean, it's, I don't want to crack that off and hand it around, but you can come up and feel it. It's pretty, it's pretty bare. Uh, it's usually kind of got a shiny appearance just because of how it looks. Uh, Hairless it is. So you'll note that is water hemp or palmer amaranth. There's also a species of pigweed called spiny amaranth. Uh, but you're going to know if it's spiny just because underneath the leaf here, where the leaf comes out, you're going to have a pretty large spine that you're going to prick your finger on if you try to pull that up. Um, so it's a dead giveaway for spiny amaranth. Uh, the next difference we're going to look at, we look at the stem, see if it's hair hairless or has hair. Uh, once we know that it's probably a palmer or water hemp, then we want to look at the leaves. So you can see here, the water hemp on the left, we have a bit of a longer leaf, <coughs> more of a diamond shape, kind of tapers off here at the bottom. But with the palmer amaranth, you can see that that tapering is much more uh, sudden, happens a lot sooner, and you result in a much shorter leaf, but yet a much larger petiole, so we'll have that leaf connects to the stem. And a good indicator, some of you might have already seen a picture like this before, for palmer amaranth, you can take that leaf, that petiole, and fold it back over. And if it's longer than the leaf is, uh, then it's typically palmer amaranth. Um, with the water hemp, the leaf is so long itself relative to that petiole, uh, you're not going to be able to have uh, something like that. Now we get later in the season, we're scouting, say, after looking for escapes from post-emergent herbicide application. Uh, can start looking once they put flowers on. We can start looking at these flower heads, and it makes it a lot easier to identify these plants. Um, so you see the red root and the smooth. I'm going to start with those. You can see a lot more bunched seed head, a little bit thicker, and not too much branching relative to the water hemp, which has quite a bit of branching. You can see this one here. It's a pretty good crop. Uh, a lot of branching on the flower heads. You can see it's also very thin, very skinny, and wiry. And you come back and look at that palmer amaranth, and it's almost like a thick cactus on the top of that plant. It's very uh, thick, less branching, um, very long. So we see all those are all pretty short, let's say inches. This one's pretty big. But you can still see these flower heads. These individual flower heads are pretty short. You know, not none longer than six inches, I would say. But this palmer amaranth plant, we measure those flowering heads in feet, typically. So that's a big difference you're going to notice. So looking these two up close, again, I would kind of talk about the thin wiry seed heads on the water hemp. And there's a Palmer Amaranth picture we took from Alfalfa Field in Grant County. Uh, you can see some branching, but compared relative to the water hemp, it's nothing like it. Extremely long seed heads, very, very thick. And you're going to see from this picture here, these are from Palmer Amaranth plants, but this slide kind of relates to water hemp too. Uh, you can see these extremely sharp bracts on the female plant. Uh, once those put on seed, once those come out and mature a little bit, they dry down. Those bracts around the palmer amaranth flower become extremely sharp. Where you notice, you can take, back over here actually, over. You take this water hemp, for instance, the best way to check to see if it's a male or a female is to grab that flower at a certain point, rub it between your fingers like that. This one didn't 
live long enough to produce any seed, but you'd see black seed coming out of it. If you tried to do that with Palmer amaranth, you'd probably draw some blood pretty quickly. So it's extremely sharp. <coughs> Uh, but I did want to make this point here, another good way to tell between whether you're going to have a seed producer or not. Uh, male plants here, like the one on the left, are only going to have anthers that produce pollen. So you're going to see those little yellow-headed anthers coming out of the flowers. Um, right away you know that's not a huge priority, it's not going to produce seed for the next year. You can take it out of the field anyway because it's probably going to compete with your crop. But when you come across one like this, and you can, you can it's kind of hard to see because the stigmas are so small and feathery like, like you can see that white kind of reflective color and that's going to be those stigmas which collect that pollen, they grab that pollen when the uh, anthers produce it and that's what actually takes that down into the ovaries, produces that seed. So the females are the ones you want to watch out for. Those are the ones that are extremely sharp. The males, no problem at all. They don't have those sharp racks like the females do and that's just with palmer ant. Again, as I showed you there with the water hand, you can rub it between your fingers pretty easy uh, and, and no problem. And again, here's a picture of what that seed will look like. Seed is almost identical for the palmer and the water hand. Any of the pigweeds really, they all look extremely similar. So you can't just look at the seed and <coughs> tell the difference. Uh, there's no real difference in size or anything like you might have with a common or a giant ragweed. Um, there's just another picture side by side of that water hemp seed head, plant, uh, flowering head. Uh, you can see the close up of the bracts there. Much sharper with the palmer amaranth on the right. I wish, I'd, I, wish I had some dorm in the greenhouse to bring you guys. So now we know our weeds. Uh, we move into the next step. You know, we want to utilize those diverse management practices. Uh, so this can range from a number of things. We want to start with a clean field. Uh, you know, if you're planning to a weedy field, you're going to have competition right off the bat. You need to make sure you extend that weed-free, critical weed-free period as long as you can. Give your crop a chance to grow up uh, and have a little head start against your weeds. That's where um, pre-emergence herbicide application becomes extremely important. Uh, highly recommended for soybeans, uh, especially if you're dealing with pigweed issues. Um, utilize cultural practices, so narrow up that row spacing if you can. Um, make sure you're doing optimal seeding rates to create the best chance for your crop to compete uh, and try to plant as early as you can. If, uh, and this isn't from just a weed management standpoint. Um, planting earlier uh, in soybean is early, you know, as early as the first of May. Uh, you're losing yield if you, if you plant any later than that. Um, studies shown, Sean Conley's had plenty of studies that show that. Um, if necessary, herbicides aren't getting it done. Uh, mechanical practices. Uh, where they are allowed uh, are pretty appropriate, especially effective with pigweeds. Um, in a row cultivation can be used mid season. Um, also, rotary hoeing, hoeing uh, right after planting can be pretty effective, it's been known to be pretty effective against the small seed annual pigweeds. Um, and you also want to do all your work in your harvest or your infested fields last. So, whether that be planting, whether that be your tillage, whether that be your harvesting. You want to go through those fields that you know you have herbicide resistance in last. Um, you don't want that equipment to spread around and spread that soil to other fields. Uh, and you need to make sure, as as much as it sucks, and I would know I had to do it, uh, cleaning that equipment as soon as you get out of those uh, infested fields. Clean it off, especially the tillage equipment, because you spread that, you know, spread that soil, a little bit of soil. Those seeds are so small. Uh, and it's pretty easy to spread from one field to another. You can see behind the combine, the windrows, where the, the weeds pop up the next year, the palmer amaranth, the water hemp I've seen. Uh, I've got pictures of it where you can just see the windrows going by. And you can see where they harvested the previous year. Um, scouting routinely is also very important. Once you, before and after herbicide application, uh, you want to know before application, obviously, because you want to make sure you can get that application down before your weeds get too big. Uh, you want to scout afterwards because you want to make sure you don't have any escapes or none too many. Uh, I would say, I would recommend a zero tolerance policy with pigweeds, especially if you know you've got resistance. Um, one plant can produce as much as 600,000 seeds for water and palm rain rain plants, so they're no joke. Uh, I would just, if you see an escape from one of those weeds, uh, you need to get out there and, and grab it. You can see pretty quickly end up with this, like this picture on the bottom right here, that's a field eye. Sample from in Crawford County, I believe. 
we walked into that. It was the first year we heard about it. And uh, to me, that looks like about a three or four year problem. They've just been sitting on it to find life safe. Uh, and they finally decided to call us up because they couldn't do anything about it. They basically didn't have a crop. Uh, so don't let it get to that point because then you're going you're gonna to be in a really uphill battle. Also, preventing weed seed production. That gets into the scouting afterwards. Don't let any escapes uh, get through the harvest. Uh, using herbicides is also obviously very important. We don't want to throw that out the table entirely. It's just need to be able to manage effectively with the herbicides using other, other strategies as well. Paint mixing, effective modes of action. You know we're going to hit that target weed species. No point in Spray an ALS inhibitor if you know you have ALS inhibitor resistance. No point in spraying uh, glyphosate Roundup alone if you have glyphosate resistant plants in your field. Uh, paint mix for for pre and post. Um, use residuals on the post uh, post emergent herbicide application so you can extend that control even longer and make sure that canopy closes up and then you're you're pretty good to go at that point. Um, rotating crop traits is another option. It's not common at all but it's something I always throw out there because it's something interesting. Um, using a, <coughs> a glyphosate resistant uh, trait one year, the next year, or next two years using a, a glufosinate resistant trait, um, you're throwing in another mode of action with the, uh, with the glufosinate compared to glyphosate. Uh, it's just something to think about. I know it's not extremely common and it can be a lot of work, but it, it would be effective. Uh, also, always, always, always follow the label. Make sure you're spraying at the right rate Use the labeled rates, not less, not more. Uh, spray at the right height of the plant. You don't want to spray plants when they're two or three feet tall but double the rate around up because it's not going to do it. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, and make sure you're spraying at the right, at the right time. If you need any more information, uh, I kind of mentioned take action on weeds.com. Uh, they had that. They had a really nice bulletin with all 12 best management practices. They've got a lot of other really good stuff, good information on not just the pig weeds, but other herbicide resistant weeds that are pretty big nationwide. Uh, some of those graphs I showed you early on for kind of source from weedscience.org, Dr. Ian Heath runs a really, really good website. It's not just for the U.S., it's as you saw globally, uh, internationally. Uh, you can pull up stats on herbicide resistance by species, by site of action, by country, by state in the U.S. Um, you can get a lot of really good information from there. Uh, I highly recommend both of these sites if you have any questions uh, that, that you can't get to, to me or to, to Sean or to Dave. Uh, and with that, if you guys need to contact uh, me or my advisors, our contact information is here. I, unfortunately, am going to be graduating here in a couple weeks, um, defending my thesis in the middle of March. So I'm not going to be around too much longer. Um, but fortunately, Sean and Sean and Dave will be around. And I uh, don't know how much word spread this far, but we do have a new uh, extension weed scientist coming in to fill Vince Davis's position and interviewing for him right now. Should be here hopefully by the end of the summer. Uh, that position should be filled. Uh, also, just want to give thanks to all the people, graduates, undergraduates, that helped out with collecting water hip in the field, um, for <coughs> me spray, for, for getting data on it. And I want to thank the United Soybean Board uh, for funding the research done. Um, and with that, I'll take some questions if you guys have any.